So in the uh, last class, we were looking at the uh, challenges um, that uh, we face in designing a uh, scramjet combustor. Okay. So um, just to recap uh, briefly what we uh, talked about, uh, we said that the uh, flow is uh, decelerated from a free stream Mach number of 7.5 to uh, a Mach number of around 2 to 2.5 at entry to the combustor as uh, shown here. And uh, we also highlighted the fact that the free stream stagnation pressure is around uh, 1 to 1 1.2 MPa and uh, by the time it reaches, the flow reaches the uh, isolator, the uh, stagnation pressure reduces down to about 0 0.3 megapascal, which means that the uh, stagnation pressure recovery in such high speed intakes is only of the order of about 30 percent or so. The uh, most challenging uh, feature probably uh, in designing the combustor has to do with the flow velocity which is about 1.2 kilometer per second. So the axial velocity of the flow in this direction as it enters the combustor is of the order of about 1.2 kilometer per second. And current scramjet uh, engine designs are looking at combustors uh, of the uh, which are about 1 meter long, which means that the uh, fuel or the air uh, will stay in the combustor only for about a uh, for a period of 1 millisecond. So within this millisecond fuel has to be injected, mixed and burnt uh, which is an extremely challenging task. Okay, so the choice of fuel is uh, very crucial uh, for, uh, for a scramjet engine and let us take a look at what kind of uh, fuels have been used in the, uh, in the past. Okay. Uh, the most uh, uh, popular fuel of course is hydrogen, gaseous hydrogen is the most popular. It has lots of desirable features as I have shown in uh, green here, it has lots of desirable features. It has very high diffusivity which means <coughs> it will try to mix by itself because it moves uh, so fast and the diffusivity is so high, the uh, hydrogen will actually mix much better. Number one, number two it has uh, probably uh, one of the lowest ignition energy. So it is very easy to ignite which is uh, very desirable and most importantly it has very wide flammability limits. So the flammability limit by volume percentage in air can uh, vary between 4 to 75 percent by volume in air. So that is an extremely wide range of flammability which is very important in a scramjet combustor because if you are not able to get the fuel mixed properly in stoichiometric proportion. There are going to be regions where the mixture is going to be either too lean or too rich. So having a wide flammability limit helps in sustaining, achieving and sustaining combustion across the cross section of the combustor. So that is very desirable and uh, hydrogen also has uh, uh, high calorific value about approximately 3 times compared to hydrocarbon fuels. Hydrocarbon fuels typically have calorific values between 40 to 50 mega joule per kilogram probably around 40 to 45 and hydrogen has about 3 times as uh, much calorific value. But probably one of the most uh, stringent disadvantages of hydrogen is its low density. Okay? Although the calorific value uh, may be quite high uh, for releasing a certain amount of energy, if you want to carry a certain amount of hydrogen, let us say 10 kilograms of hydrogen, because the density is so low the volume of the tank that is required to carry such an amount of hydrogen will be very large. And that is one of the biggest disadvantages of uh, using hydrogen as a fuel. But it has many of the other desirable features. Of course, we can think of uh, using liquid hydrogen. But then we would need uh, the capability to store cryogenic fuels. So the tankage becomes complicated there because the fuel has to be stored under cryogenic conditions. So the accompanying you know uh, insulation and other things to keep it under cryogenic condition becomes very stringent. So hydrogen has many desirable properties as you can see here, but the density is a major disadvantage with the hydrogen fuel which has led researchers in the past to try fuels like uh, uh, ethylene. For example, ethylene is uh, widely used, it is a gaseous fuel, higher molecular weight which means it has higher density okay? and it has reasonably good uh, flammability limits about 2.7 to 36 percent uh, by volume in air which is actually quite good. Uh, but the calorific value as you can see is about one third of hydrogen and as I have indicated that in red here. But this is not a major uh, disadvantage in terms of uh, because if you compare the amount of uh, ethylene that you have to carry or the volume of tank required to carry a certain amount of ethylene, then we are actually benefiting a lot. The molecular weight of ethylene is about 28 
which is 40 times more than that of hydrogen. So, we are getting a factor of 14 advantage here, but we are getting a factor of 3 disadvantage in the calorific value. So, the advantage more than overweighs, outweighs the disadvantage. Okay. So, ethylene from that perspective is a very desirable fuel. Hydrogen will always be the best fuel. Hydrogen is almost an explosive, but it is only because the density is so low that we are forced to look at other choices. This is not, uh, this challenge is not unique to scramjets. Even automotive applications which want to use uh, hydrogen as a fuel are faced with the same constraint. Because the density is so low, if you compare a uh, standard automobile today, it can carry about 30 liters of petrol. That is approximately about, if you assume the specific gravity of petrol to be 0 0.8, that is approximately 24, 30 liters of petrol works out to about 24 kgs of petrol. So, 24 times about 40 megajoules per kg gives you the amount of energy that you are carrying. In order to carry the same amount of energy using hydrogen, the tankage under atmospheric pressure conditions will be very large. If you are going to use it uh, in a compressed form, then you cannot use petrol tanks which are made only out of sheet metal. Right now, petrol tanks are made out of sheet metal because they are operating at atmospheric pressure. Whereas, if you are going to store the gas in compressed form, then you need pressure vessels which are going to have thick walls to withstand the pressure difference. If you want to store the hydrogen as a liquid, then that means you need to be able to store cryogenic liquids which also poses a challenge. So, this challenge with hydrogen is ubiquitous, it is everywhere, not just scramjets. Okay? Scramjets, the, uh, it is just that in scramjets, the challenges are even more than with automotive applications. So, ethylene is a good alternative to hydrogen. The uh, next alternative that is uh, widely being considered, uh, uh, India for example, uh, in their scramjet development, India is using kerosene liquid, China is also using kerosene liquid, because okay? as you can see density is much higher, almost um, a factor of 1000 higher than even ethylene, almost. Okay? So, this has a much higher density lower calor calorific value, but the major disadvantage is that it has a very narrow flammability limit. Compare uh, 2.7 to 36 percent by volume to 0 0.6 to 4.9 percent by volume. If it is more than this, it won't burn. If it is less than this, it won't burn. So, that means the range is very narrow, which means if you are going to use kerosene as a fuel in your scramjet engine, what is the most crucial aspect from the flammability? What is the most crucial aspect? mixing. We need to make sure that the fuel is mixed under stoichiometric proportions at across the entire cross section of the combustor, right, because the flammability limit is so narrow. Of course, one fuel that is very interesting and which is also uh, making uh, its appearance these days in scramjet application is something that comes out of uh, an effort that most engineers almost always do. If you remember, we talked about propellers and we talked about jets. Then we said, why not have something which combines the best advantages or best features of the propellers and the best features of the jet. And we came up with the turbofan engine. Similarly here, why do not we combine the advantages of hydrogen, which are these, these are these aspects in green and the advantage of kerosene, which is this. Remember, for hydrogen, this is the only disadvantage. It so happens that kerosene, that is the only advantage. Why not combine these two? If we can combine these two, then we will have a nice fuel, right? That is what people are doing today. That is what engineers are doing today. This is called effervescent kerosene or bubbly kerosene. So, what you do is you bubble the hydrogen through the kerosene. So, the fuel that is used is neither pure kerosene nor pure hydrogen, but it is effervescent kerosene. So, it combines advantages of both and uh, is actually a very good alternative in these types of applications. Okay. So, these are the fuels that are used. The choice of fuel is very critical as I said because the uh, processes, the combustion, entire combustion process has to be completed within 1 millisecond, which means that the fuel should uh, mix well. It should, if it is a liquid fuel, then we are adding another time scale. We need to worry about that also. Okay. So, the choice of fuel is very critical in scramjets because the time available from start to finish of the combustion process is only 1 millisecond. 
remember chemical time scales themselves may be of the order of 10 to the minus 6 seconds or slightly more than that. But now this is becoming comparable to chemical time scales. That is the problem with the scramjet. The probably the most critical uh, issue in uh, scramjet is that there are two important time scales. One is chemical time scale. Chemical reactions themselves will take a certain time to initiate and complete. That is usually of the order of about microseconds <coughs> approximately. The fastest reactions will usually be of the order of about microseconds. Now, there is another time scale involved in uh, supersonic combustion and that is to get the fuel mixed with the air within the flammability limit that you want, right. So, those uh, mixing time scales are much longer. They probably are of the order of a millisecond or more than that. So, you will see that most cramjet combustors, the limiting time scale is the mixing time scale. The challenge is not in the chemistry, but the challenge is in getting the fuel mixed with the air. That is the most challenging aspect in almost all scramjet combustors. If you have a liquid fuel, then another time scale comes into play and that is the evaporation time scale, which is even slower, okay. So, this, so mixing almost all scramjet combustors are controlled by mixing and not by kinetics, okay. So, anything that you can do to improve the mixing will be a very good advantage in terms of uh, scramjet combustion process, okay. Now, let us take a look at uh, fundamental issues in supersonic combustion. <coughs> As you know, the uh, basic objective of any scramjet engine is to produce thrust as shown in this box here. The idea is to produce thrust, okay. And as we uh, saw earlier, we produce thrust by increasing the specific enthalpy of the fluid and then converting it to kinetic energy. So, the thrust will depend uh, very much upon the heat release that takes place in the combustor. Okay. Now, the heat release itself in turn depends upon the combustion process. If the combustion process is very efficient, then there will be a lot of heat release. Otherwise, heat release is going to be less. Now, normally the heat release will depend only on the combustion process. Now, in a compressible flow, very high speed compressible flow such as the one that we have in a supersonic combustor, the heat release as you know is also limited by the Mach number at which the flow enters that comes from the Rayleigh curve. So, if the combustor inlet Mach number has a certain value, then there is only so much heat that you can add in the combustor before it will thermally choke and alter the flow conditions. Okay. So, you can see that heat release in this case is controlled by two factors. Number one, combustion itself and number two, the combustor inlet Mach number. And if you remember for the supersonic combustor, since you are operating on the supersonic branch of the Rayleigh curve, the higher the combustor inlet Mach number, the more heat we can add before it will thermally choke, right. So, higher is better from a heat release perspective for combustor inlet Mach number. Okay. So, these are the two limiting factors in heat release in a combustor and ultimately upon thrust in the supersonic combustor. Now, the combustion process itself depends upon <coughs> three factors. Okay. If it is a liquid fuel, injection plays a very critical role in the case of a uh, scramjet combustor because the injection strategy determines the droplet size. Okay smaller the droplets, the better they will burn, the faster they will evaporate and burn. However, if the droplets are smaller, they will not be able to penetrate the flow and mix with the fuel. They tend to be uh, swept downstream by the flow. The biggest challenge in a scramjet combustor is that if the flow is from this way to this left to right like this, right. So, the flow is moving at a speed of 1.2 kilometer per second from left to right. So, if you take a cross section, the challenge is to get the fuel to spread across the entire cross section. So, the challenge is to get the fuel to move in the span wise direction and in the vertical direction. Because this flow is moving so fast, any time you inject fuel, the tendency is for the fuel to be blown downstream rather than moving to occupy the entire cross section. So, the challenge is to get the fuel to move perpendicular to the flow stream, either in the vertical direction or in the span wise direction. It is only when it occupies the entire cross section that you will get uniform heat release and good combustion, okay. So, if you have small droplets, because they are so small, they tend to get swept downstream by the flow and they will not go move across the cross section. 
if you have larger droplets, they will actually penetrate. But the problem is they will also take a longer time to evaporate. So from a combustion perspective, smaller droplet is better, but it is not good from a mixing perspective. So from a mixing perspective, larger droplet is better, but it is not good from a combustion perspective. So the injection uh, and the injection strategy plays a crucial role. You need to get droplet diameters, typically droplet diameters around 30 microns seem to be ideal for scramjet uh, combustion. That is what is generally desired. Anything less than that is not good, more than that is also not good. 30 microns is the dro preferred droplet size in these types of applications for these types of combustors, okay, which are about a meter long. The next important aspect in, uh, in combustion is mixing as we have emphasized this uh, already. Mixing is the most important thing. By mixing what I mean is if you take a cross section of the combustor, the fuel and the air should be well mixed across this cross section. So that heat release takes place across the entire cross section and not in isolated pockets in the combustor. That is a very important requirement for the scram, uh, for scramjet application. Remember we are talking about very high operating temperatures which means we want the heat release to be more uniform, not in isolated pockets. The other factor in uh, which controls combustion is flame holding. Now in a supersonic combustor, we may actually have a design where we are able to get the fuel to mix and burn. But more than mixing and burning, we must also make sure that it continues to burn. So that is what we mean by flame holding. How do we ensure that the heat release takes place continuously? Maybe we can initiate heat release, but it may get extinguished. So how do we continue to uh, sustain the heat release is what this flame holding strategy is all about. And remember, this is a supersonic flow at Mach number 2 to 2.5. So we cannot put our traditional V gutters. Remember, in an afterburner duct, we use the V gutters for flame stabilization. Right? If you put the same thing in this flow, you will trigger a strong bow shock and there will be substantial loss of stagnation pressure, which is not good. Right? So we have to use aerodynamic kind of flame holding devices for this indirect flame holding. Okay, which is uh, which is a challenge and if you think about it, the cross flow speed is 1.2 kilometer per second. Sustaining a flame in such speeds is an extremely challenging task. If the velocity were to come down, then flame holding will be easier to do. I can sustain the heat release in a uh, low speed flow, but not in such high speed flows. So from a flame holding perspective, you can see that we will uh, take a look at that also. So flame holding is also a challenge okay? and we will see what affects this. Right? So injection as we said depends mostly on atomization, atomization of the fuel. We want the fuel to be atomized to typically shorter mean diameters around 30 microns or so. That is ideal for this. So we have to design proper atomizers which will accomplish this. So if you are able to inject droplets with uh, that type of diameter, there is enough time for them to evaporate, mix and burn. Okay. Mixing of course is important for stoichiometry. So the fuel and air should be mixed in stoichiometric proportions and for uh, hydrocarbon fuels, especially liquid fuels, the flammability limit is very narrow. That is why we talked about flammability limit. So we must make sure that they are uh, mixed properly so that the combustion will take place under stoichiometric conditions. Remember because the uh, length of the combustor is so small, if the fuel that is injected leaves the combustor without burning, then it is not releasing its heat. So the combustion efficiency will go down and the thrust produced will also go down. The ideal thing is to have high combustion efficiencies. All the fuel that we inject must burn, but that is not possible to ensure in supersonic combustors. Typical supersonic combustors which use liquid kerosene as a fuel will have combustion efficiencies around 70 to 75 percent at best. That means only 70 to 75 percent of the fuel burns. Mixing efficiency for such uh, fuels will be of the order of about 80 to 85 percent, which means only 80 to 85 percent of the fuel actually is mixed with properly with air. Degree of mixing, which is another mixing metric, is about 90 percent or so. Degree of mixing simply looks to see how much of the cross section is occupied by fuel. 
it does not check to see whether the fuel and oxygen at each point are in stoichiometric proportion that is mixing efficiency ok. Degree of mixing simply looks to see how much of the cross section has fuel in it. So, typical kerosene combustors will have degree of mixing around 90 percent or so which is actually a very good metric. If you can get kerosene to occupy 90 percent of the cross section that is very good. And if you can get the mixing efficiency to about 80 to 85 percent that is actually very good also because that means in this 90 percent of the cross section 80 to 85 percent is likely to burn under stoichiometric conditions. After that only 75 percent actually burns and releases its heat. So, you can see progressively how things go down. This also tell you the different metrics that we use to assess the performance of the combustor. Remember mixing all these combustors are mixing controlled. So, ensuring good mixing is the key challenge in these types of applications which is why we have so many different metrics for assessing how well it is mixed ok. Loss of stagnation pressure is also a very good metric for assessing mixing because mixing as you know is thermodynamically an irreversible process. So, the better the mixing the higher the loss of stagnation pressure unfortunately right. So, these are conflicting considerations. So, from a flame holding perspective as I said lower combustor inlet Mach number is better because velocities are lower I can have better flame stability. So, you can see that from a heat release perspective I want the combustor inlet Mach number to be higher from a flame holding perspective I would prefer it to be lower. So, these are two conflicting considerations which we have to live with and design for ok. So, these are the fundamental issues in supersonic combustion this is the reason why it continues to be challenging. As I said the flame holding is going to be aerodynamic and not mechanical. Mechanical flame holding would mean putting V gutters, but this is not going to work in this case it has to be aerodynamic. What are the different strategies that have been used in the past for injection flame holding? You can see these strategies here. Uh, one popular uh, injection strategy is to inject through the wall and also through these types of cavities these cavities provide these kinds of recirculating uh, flow and uh, presumably they increase the mixing of the fuel because there is a, an unsteady uh, shedding of the uh, shear layer from the leading edge of the cavity. This is the leading edge of the cavity. So, this shear layer sheds unsteadily and as you inject the fuel the hope is that these unsteady vortices will actually carry the fuel and mix it better with the air. Okay. And if you inject a fuel into a supersonic stream you can see that there is going to be a bow shock ahead of the ahead of the uh, fuel jet, but this shock is not so strong as to cause this flow to become subsonic this is ok this is only a gas jet. There will be a bow shock, but not strong enough to uh, cause the flow to become subsonic ok. So, this is the fuel this is the air and the one in green is actually the shock wave in the all these figures green denotes the shock waves. So, shock waves are actually uh, triggered intentionally in these applications to improve mixing because you know that across the shock wave there is a velocity gradient right. Velocity gradient can generate vorticity and improve mixing. So, that is one reason why you trigger shock waves or control strength to improve mixing ok. This is plain mixing which is through the wall. So, you can see that there are injectors on the wall we inject the fuel at an angle and this create this uh, creates bow shocks ahead of the uh, fuel jet, but this strategy will probably have the poorest mixing because in this case since the cross flow velocity is so high the fuel that is injected through the wall tends to stay near the wall and if it burns it will try to burn near the wall which is very detrimental for the wall. And the heat release will likely melt the combustor wall rather than go into the flow. We want the heat release to go into the flow not melt the combustor ok. So, the wall injection in that sense is very poor ok, cavities are somewhat better. Now, the other injection strategy is to use something called a ramp injection. Remember we said just now that if you try to put any obstruction in this flow it is a supersonic flow this will this may cause a strong bow shock, but the ramps are aerodynamically designed. Okay, this is not just about any kind of ramp these are aerodynamically designed and the objective is to create these types of oblique shock waves from the leading edges of the ramp. And the reflection of the oblique shock wave the dimensions of the ramp are such that when the oblique shocks are reflected they impinge upon the fuel jet 
and the velocity gradient across the shock will then carry the fuel, generate vorticity and carry the fuel and mix it with the air. That is the idea. Okay. So, these are aerodynamically designed ramps and the dimensions of the combustor, dimensions of the ramp and the angles are such that the shock should focus back on the fuel jet that comes out. So, here we are injecting parallel to the flow, here we are injecting normal to the flow, here we are injecting at an angle to the flow. All these are also have been tried, normal injection, uh, tangential injection and angled injection. Now, in the in these types of high speed flows, if you inject normally, that will give you the best penetration and mixing. If you inject tangentially, that gives the poorest penetration and mixing with angled injection going in between. Okay. So, a combination, a judicious combination of all this have always been tried. Okay. So, this is injection through a ramp, here you are seeing injection through a properly designed strut. Notice that in this case of the ramp and the strut, because you have separated flow at the uh, base of the ramp, right? There is, go there is going to be flow separation from these corners at the base of the ramp, and there is also going to be flow separation here downstream of the strut. So, these uh, flow separation regions provide actually a region of low speed flow where there is always going to be combustion gases. So, these provide the flame holders that we are looking for. So, we do not have separate flame holders, this is why this type of flame holding is called aerodynamic flame holding. So, we create these types of uh, separated flow regions intentionally, low speed separated flow regions intentionally for flame holding purposes. Okay? And because these are designed aerodynamically, we will not have a problem with the bow shock being too strong. So, the injector serves two purposes, it serves to inject the fuel and now it is also designed to provide flame holding. For example, this step here on the wall of the combustor also is useful for flame holding because there is going to be flow separation here inside the cavity and this will provide a low speed region which has hot combustion products which acts like a kernel for a flame. Okay. So, these are strategies that have been tried in the past, but all these devices have practical issues when you try to scale them up to realistic sizes, many of these things do not work as well. The combustors are small, they work very well, but when you scale it up to real life sizes, they do not really scale very well. So, scalability is also a major issue with scramjet combustors. Okay. This is a cross sectional view of an actual combustor that is being used uh, or that is being tried out with the DRDL HSTDV vehicle. So, this is a full size combustor and you can see what is being done to get the fuel to mix. Remember getting the fuel to occupy the entire cross section is the challenge. So, as the saying goes, if you cannot uh, get the fuel to go there, you put the fuel there. This is the cross section of the combustor. If I cannot get the fuel to uh, inject here, I would like the fuel to go there it is not able to do that because of the cross flow. Then the strategy is do not inject the fuel here, inject the fuel there. right? And that is what this strategy does. You can see that each one of this is a strut which runs from the top to the bottom. And there are fuel injection holes along this face on both sides. Okay? So, each one has about 22 fuel injectors along this face. So, you can see that here the strut is located right in the middle. So, here the two struts are uh, situated further apart. So, if now the flow is in this direction, the first strut is like this right in the middle. The next two struts are located slightly apart. The next two struts are located in between these two. So, what have we done by this strategy? I have now covered the entire cross section of the combustor. So, if you cannot get the fuel to go there, put the fuel there. That is the strategy. So, you cover the, uh, you, you locate the struts in such a way that you cover the entire cross section of the combustor. The hope is that by the time you come into this region, the fuel will occupy the entire cross section of the combustor. This is a strategy which is very effective and this particular combustor has degree of mixing about 90 or more as I told you. Okay, very good degree of mixing. So, if you look at the exit of the combustor, 90 percent of the cross section is occupied by fuel, which is actually an extremely good thing. This uses kerosene fuel. Okay. Whether you can get that fuel to burn is the next challenge. The first thing is to get the fuel to mix. Right? So, the uh, degree of mixing tells me how much I have managed to spread the fuel. 
but because the flammability limit for kerosene is so narrow. If the value of uh, the mass fraction of uh, or the volume fraction of kerosene is outside the flammability limit, then what happens is kerosene may be present, but it is not going to burn because the proportion of kerosene and the air is not within the flammability limit. Right? Remember what we said about uh, the um, flammability limit for kerosene the flammability limit is between 0 0.6 to about 4 or so 4 percent by volume in air. So, if it is outside the flammability limit I may have kerosene, but it is not going to burn which is why we have two matrix one called degree of mixing which only tracks the presence or absence of fuel, but that is not sufficient once I have that I need to find out how much of this fuel is actually present in stoichiometric proportion or close to stoichiometric proportion that is what the mixing efficiency metric does. So, the mixing efficiency for these types of combustors will be about 80 percent or so. That means, if 90 percent of the cross section is occupied by the fuel of that only 80 percent will burn under stoichiometric conditions or only 80 percent is within the flammability limit. So, what I need to do is so that so the challenge in a scramjet combustor design is to get the degree of mixing to be as high as possible that is the first step. I get the degree of mixing to be as high as possible after I do that now I start looking at mixing efficiency how do I improve the mixing efficiency now. These are the challenges right and this combustor works very well in fact uh, someone asked this question about why not put a divergence you see that the combustor actually has a mild divergence here another divergence here and another divergence here these are all very small divergences 2, higher, two degrees 4 degrees and 5 degrees. Okay. What is the purpose of the divergence in this combustor? To reduce the th thermal choking. Ah, what this does is remember the heat release in the combustor tends to reduce the Mach number you know that from your relief flow anytime you release heat the Mach number reduces. Now, this is a supersonic flow right. So, when I add uh, heat to a supersonic flow the Mach number reduces. What happens if the supersonic flow goes into a diverging passage what happens to the Mach number? Mach number increases. So, we have created competing effects. So, the heat release tries to reduce the Mach number the divergence tries to increase the Mach number. So, what happens is I can actually design a combustor where the Mach number remains more or less constant across the entire length of the combustor. So, this avoids the thermal choking problem that we were talking about not entirely, but to a large extent for the range of operating conditions that we are envisaging the thermal choking can be avoided by having these types of divergences. Okay. Of course, in addition to this we also have the isolator as you can see from here. If the heat release is so high that the, uh, the pressure rise begins to propagate upward we also have the isolator which will try to contain the pressure rise in this and prevent it from going into the intake. So, we already have divergence which is trying to counter the thermal choking problem and we also have the isolator on top of that to contain this within this. Okay. So, normally what happens in these combustors is we are calling this supersonic combustion ramjet, but the term is actually it sounds nice, but it is actually very difficult to verify. What exactly do we mean by supersonic combustion ramjet? There are two possibilities number one the flow enters the combustor with supersonic Mach number and the flow leaves the combustor with supersonic Mach number, but the flow probably is subsonic within the combustor that is one situation. The other situation is we have continuous flow path from the intake all the way to the exit which are supersonic. So, I can draw a line I can draw a streamline or I can draw a line all the way from the inlet to the exit of the combustor and the Mach number is supersonic along this line for the entire length of the combustor. Generally the first type of situation where the flow is supersonic at entry, supersonic at exit, but not inside that is called uh, dual mode scramjet. Okay. If there are continuous supersonic paths from the inlet to the exit that is called a pure scram mode. So, there are two modes to this combustor a dual mode and a complete scram mode. 
Scram mode means is supersonic combustion throughout. There are supersonic paths that are available. Okay. That is very desirable, but in practice most of these combustors will probably operate in the dual mode rather than in the pure scram mode. Okay. That is not, it may not be possible to avoid that. Okay. Any questions? Uh, Where is igniter? Normally the, the normally the air that is coming in is so hard that we should be able to, the fuel will be able to ignite when it goes inside this. The temperatures are very high, static temperatures are very high. You may not need special igniters for this, but even if they are required, they will be provided in the uh, fuel injector itself. You may have a pilot flame slightly ahead of this with the injector. That will provide the heat that is required for burning the fuel for the downstream. Now, we talked about fundamental issues in supersonic combustion as a process. These are the fundamental issues in developing a supersonic combustor. Okay? The combustion process has fundamental difficulties. What are the challenges in realizing a supersonic combustor? That is what this talks about. Okay? Now, wind tunnel testing of full scale combustors is very difficult to do. Remember, we are talking about uh, generally flow rates, typical flow rates in these uh, types of applications are of the order of about 8 to 10 kg per second. 8 to 10 kg per second, uh, stagnation pressure 0 0.3 ampere, stagnation temperature 2000 Kelvin. We are talking about wind tunnels which should be generating enthalpies of the order of megajoules. Such wind tunnels are uh, not available uh, or they are available only in very few play countries in the world. Russia has one or two, uh, US has, but none of the other countries have uh, such high enthalpy wind tunnels. So even if you develop a combustor, it is very difficult to actually test it. Okay? And because the uh, scramjet, the operating temperature in the combustor of a scramjet is very high, it is almost impossible to measure anything inside the combustor. We can measure wall static pressure at best, that is what people are doing these days. We can take exit gas sampling, but that is not really very helpful because it does not tell us what is going on inside the combustor, where the problem areas are, where we need to improve. So that kind of measurement is still lacking measuring temperatures or any other quantity in this types of environment is very difficult to do. Okay? And uh, fabrication is also very challenging because we need exotic materials for fabricating the strut, struts and also the walls of the combustor because they need to withstand very high temperatures. So if you uh, take these materials, then machining them to the required tolerances, to the required shapes is an extremely difficult thing to do. Okay. So fabrication is also very difficult to do which is why only probably very few prototypes can be fabricated. Even fabricating one or two uh, prototypes is very difficult to do. And then testing it is also very difficult to do. Which means that uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics has to be used as a virtual wind tunnel. We need to have reliable predictions, accurate simulations so that uh, we can make good predictions about the pressure rise, the distributions and all the other quantities that you want. And then so you look at a set of designs and then look at, uh, look at a comparative exercise of these different designs and then shortlist one or two which can be used for final fabrication, prototyping and fabrication. Okay? And that is the strategy that is being pursued by many of the uh, countries today which do not have this high enthalpy wind tunnels. Okay? Simulations in this case are the way to go. Okay? So let us see. So we have uh, covered the entire range of propulsion technologies uh, that we wanted to study. Uh, we looked at turbo jets, we looked at turbo fans, uh, after burning turbo jets, we have seen ram jets and also scram jets. Okay, we have done uh, thrust calculations, we have looked at gas dynamic aspects which are important uh, for these uh, types of devices as we said. Uh, compressibility effects are very uh, important in all these engines. Uh, probably in the gas turbine combustor, uh, the, since the velocities are uh, very small or the Mach numbers are uh, quite small, the gas turbine combustor is the only component in this range of equipment which operates uh, in the incompressible limit. 
all the other components uh, operate in with substantial compressibility effects, which was the reason why we studied gas dynamics in such uh, great detail. Then we looked at the, uh, the challenges of uh, manufacturing these devices, in designing these devices, we looked at challenges in designing compressors, operation of compressors, tip clearance, we looked at very challenging issues like that, again turbine, <coughs> turbine blades, the high temperature turbine blades, the cooling strategies, uh, manufacturing strategies like single crystals and then we looked at material challenges, you know thermal barrier coating and so on. So, we looked at all the challenges that are involved in manufacturing this turbine, uh, manufacturing these components. Okay. Then we looked at the thermodynamic and cycle aspects, what are the parameters that control the performance of the device, we looked at that. Then we actually did calculations, uh, thrust calculations of all these uh, devices except the scramjet and we saw how the thrust varied with, uh, depending upon the type of nozzles that we used, depending upon other conditions, whether it is operating at sea level or whether it is cruising at 30,000 feet, how conditions change, how mass flow rate has to be adjusted, how the uh, entry temperature to the turbine has to be adjusted. We looked at all those issues in, in great detail. Um, I hope that uh, you know students who go through these lectures uh, along with the textbooks, the, tex the lectures follow the textbooks very closely. And the problems given in the textbook are also taken from uh, very practical applications. Uh, so I hope that uh, students who go through the lecture find the lectures to be very useful, studied in conjunction with the textbooks. In my opinion, the lectures are not uh, meant to be a standalone replacement for the teacher or the textbook. The lecture is an explanation of what is written in the textbook. So, that is the way I, I look at this. So, I urge the students to uh, use both the materials to uh, benefit the most. You will benefit the most if you use both the materials. Listen to the lectures, try to uh, figure things out yourself, read the books also. And they will also add a lot of uh, value to your uh, learning and that is the best way to utilize uh, this type of uh, resource. Okay? So, I wish all the students uh, the very best of success in their endeavors and I also would like to thank you for uh, listening to the lectures, you have been very patient, thank you. <laughs>